American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Okay, are you ready? For yeah. another episode of, of American Timelines. American Timelines by History for Jerks. The greatest podcast producing outfit this side of the Mason Dixon line. Nice. This is episode 187. 187 on a motherfucking cop. Do you think referring to the Mason Dixon line is somehow racist? Oh, I don't know. I probably. I don't even know what what that line Let's is. Check. Oh boy, everything's racist. Seriously, I do think everything is racist. Any statement is saying the Mason Dixon line racist is the Mason Dixon line a racist thing? That's also right. called the Mason Dixon line is a dem- demarcation line separating four U.S. states, forming okay. part of the borders of Pennsylvania, Maryland, De- Delaware, and West Virginia. Okay. Historically, it came to be seen as demarcating the North from the South in the U.S. It was surveyed by Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, blah, blah, blah. Let me see if there's anything. The largest east-west portion of it. I was going to say this side of the Mississippi, but I don't It's know. still used today in the figurative sense of a line that separates the northeast and south culturally, politically, and socially. That's not racist so to I say So I guess it. it's not. No. Wow, something's not racist. One thing... So far, we have one, a list of one thing that is not racist. Anyway, speaking of not racist, we try to make American Timelines not a racist podcast. Um, That's right. We are jerks, and this is for jerks. Um, and it's by jerks. We are jerks. Amy's a little bit more of a jerk than I am, I think, is what I like to tell people. Uh, but this is one episode 187, 187 on a motherfucking cup. Uh, you know that song? <laughs> no, but Snoop we Dogg, didn't start Dr. yet. Yeah, we did. We didn't say welcome. Yeah, we did. Oh, I was reading we, about the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> yeah, that, we were saying welcome when you said that, I oh, think. Oh, okay. Welcome to another episode of American Timelines, I think is what we're saying. I'm Amy and that's Joe. Yeah, that's who we are and we're people. We're humans and we make mistakes. Amy makes a ton of them. Oh, and now our dogs are barking. And we like, and we like uh, to alter our consciousness sometimes. Speak for yourself, bruh. Uh, you do too. You just like it in a liquid form, my friend. Here's my question. I'm drinking a reptile juice by Twenty Six Acres Brewing. Here's my question. Okay, where's your question? <sighs> She's gonna drive me nuts if she keeps barking. What? Well, how are we gonna stop her? You got a squirt bottle. Here's my question. Okay. I was listening to a philosopher. Okay. And he said that we our society is not free until we can be free of we have freedom of consciousness. What does that mean? It means that we can alter our consciousness as we choose as long as we don't hurt other people. Like drugs, like do drugs. Yeah. So so you're saying it's not free unless we are free to do that? Yes. Unless all drugs are free? Like well. bath salts? You can do bath salts as long as you don't eat another human, which is apparently what you want to do on bath salts. Yeah. Right? I guess. If, if you don't hurt anybody else. who like? What if you hurt a squirrel? Does that count? Is that a buddy? Yeah, it's a buddy. You wouldn't want to do that. You can't eat squirrels. No. So even now, you are, I mean, everything you do is har- harming something. Like you. Harm- Me? Yeah, you want cockroaches dead, so that's... If you're high and you kill a cockroach, you are now not allowed to be high anymore. Why? We're not free. You're just not free because you're harming a cockroach. No, because I would harm the cockroach no matter what my consciousness level was. But that's saying if you still harm a cockroach while you're high, then you are not free. No, that's not what that's saying. It's saying you you should be allowed to have... To uh, to be in whatever consciousness 
you want at all times, and, and 24/7. That, and that we already have, we already do have all mind altering. You know, there's caffeine, there's alcohol, there's that's all mind altering. It just people have deemed those not as dangerous. and for some reason, but it's not necessarily true. So, do you think the reason is they don't want you to smoke weed? Is because you you know that you find out the truth when you're smoking weed. Oh, you figure it out. It's all a system. Oh, yeah, it's oppression and all that. And they want to keep know. you controlled? No, I think it was racist. It definitely was a racist reason they st- they made it illegal. Yeah. Because they, <clears throat> they said, Cause they fill we the can't jail. outlaw it to be against the war, and we can't outlaw it to be black. But if you associate the hippies with marijuana yeah, and the black people with heroin, and you make those things heavily illegal, yeah, then... Wait, heroin is... Is crack or whatever, you know. That's the same thing. Or heroin. I don't know. This is what it was in the sixties. This is what this is what um somebody right somebody uh some Republican guy said in the sixties and he said if you then you go after those things and regulate those things heavily, criminalize those things heavily. Well, I don't know what this has end of this conversation has to do with anything. But it doesn't. I just thought it was interesting. When you think of mind altering, that makes me think of mushrooms. Yes. And when I think of mushrooms, I think of Magic Mind, a supplement that I have been enjoying. Uh, It's a shot. It's a quick liquid supplement. It's got all kinds of nootropics. It's got lion's mane. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's got all kinds of mushrooms and I've I've never even heard of nootropics. Have you had you heard of nootropics before? No, that's a new one on me. So that's it's basically a bunch of supplements that. Those are, ice are, for you. are supposed to really make you uh, not you know, be more aware, focus, and not uh, rely so much on caffeine. Like you said, caffeine's a mind altering thing. So what's the difference? Right. Um, and so it was developed by these doctors, uh, and it's really kind of a cool thing mm-hmm. um, that I have been trying because they sent me. Uh, some samples uh, because they like our podcast. They're like, yo. They sent you some stool samples? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, not at all. Um, but, you know, it's like an energy drink that also combats <laughs> stress instead of like, you know, you like you think of an energy drink as being all mm-hmm. crazy and wired, and I, I'm not at all. It actually helps you uh, not be like that. So it's this little green drink with matcha adaptogens. And new traffics and honey. It's got honey too, so that everybody loves honey. So, honey, honey. So yeah, no, they didn't send me a stool sample. They sent me a sample of that, and I, I've been drinking it, and enjoying it, and everybody should enjoy it. And, uh, they, and you get a discount if you enjoy it. Yeah, if you get a, if you listen to American Timelines, you're a fan of us, and you yeah. want to try it. You can try a subscription. Uh, and use the code ATL, American Timelines. Make sure you use that code because yeah. you get how much? What do you get? You get up to 40% off a uh, subscription. You can't afford not to do that. You would be crazy not to do this. You would be a yeah. stupid idiot if you didn't use our code ATL, uh, Magic Mind. That is crazy. Dot co slash ATL. If you ain't sleeping on water, you water. <laughs> <laughs> that was a St. Louis commercial for waterbeds when I was low. And Steve Mazzarini would come out and say, if you ain't sleeping on water, you oughta. Back in the day of the waterbed. Really? Remember? As in Missouri? Yeah, everybody had waterbeds. My mom had a waterbed. Yeah, she did. That's right. Yep. Oh, and, I never did. And you know what? Now she doesn't need a waterbed because she drinks Magic Mind. It also prevents you from needing waterbeds. <laughs> okay, that's not true. I don't know. It might be true. I I don't know that that's false, but I don't know that that's true. But check out magicmind.co slash ATL and get your subs- your prescription, your subscription <laughs> discount. I'm a terrible advertiser. Uh, don't it do will that. prevent you. No, I'm a great advertiser. It'll prevent you from needing a waterbed. It'll prevent you from wanting to drink out of a waterbed, probably, too. But it's the world's first productivity shot. It's like doing a shot. We all love doing shots in college, right? Right. Yep. Uh, at the club. Anyway, it's really cool. Check it out. You'll stress less. It really makes a difference. And you can try it using our code. 
Uh, so go to that website, and then when they ask you to put in your code, put in ATL for American Timelines. Not Atlanta, American Timelines. So anyway, that said, now it's time to start. We're starting 1956. We are getting to the second half of yes. this season, this longest season ever, longest the 50s. Season known uh, we're Atlanta. getting into 56 now. We're in the in the upper 60s, the late 50s. 50s. I mean, sorry, 50s, the late 50s. So we're starting 1956. Mm-hmm. And as we always say, when we're starting a new year, there's a few things that don't quite have a date, or I couldn't find the date, even though I looked very hard this morning. Right. I'm drinking a beer. Hold on, let me take a sip. All right. Well, I'll wait for you to take a sip. <sighs> a little ASMR. A little beer drinking. Um, this Reptar juice is delicious, by the way. And I keep telling the people that make it 26 acres, I keep tweeting at them. Reptar juice is the greatest beer of all time. And they never like my tweet or say anything. Like really? I, you'd think they'd be like, oh, thanks for saying that. Like, I'm telling you, you may have the best fucking beer. You have gold on your hands. They might just think you you have disabilities. <laughs> That's true. A lot of people do. Yeah. Anyway, 1956, here are some things that happened in 1956 that I, you know, didn't really pinpoint a date. So I'm going to start with this before we jump into the timeline. All right. So here are some 1956 things, okay? NBC introduced its multicolored peacock logo oh. in 1956 to entice people to buy color TVs manufactured by RCA, which owned the network. Mm. I kind of think it's kind of funny that they chose a peacock. Well, I guess peacocks. Colorful. I guess peacocks aren't because they were already a peacock when it was black and white. Oh, it was. But it probably didn't have all those colors on it. Mm-hmm. Like they changed their logo. Yeah, so never mind. So yeah, so it made sense to make that multicolored logo. That's why it's got all those colors on it because they added. You sure colors. they had the peacock already? Oh, it introduced its multicolored peacock logo. So maybe there wasn't a peacock. Maybe it wasn't a peacock. Maybe they picked that. Oh, for the because it's colorful. Yeah, but peacocks aren't rainbow colors. They're like they made colors. that one. They're very b- vibrant birds. You're a bird. Anyway, in 1956, also the IBM 350 hard disk drive had 3.75 megabytes of storage and weighed over 2,000 pounds oh my God. and had to be moved around with forklifts. Holy shit. 3.75 megabytes. You probably don't even I have no idea. You don't have any no. frame of reference for I'm that. None. Like your phone right now has uh, like 200, like a memory card in my phone has 256 megabytes. 256 and this one just in my three. phone and this is a 2,000 pound computer that had three wow. megabytes and it was 2,000 pounds wait a minute no my phone has 275 gigabytes wow not megabytes it's so gigs. what did this computer do just tell the date I mean <laughs> it for did. three it, point it five. told you what day of the week it was right that was it yeah probably it just probably couldn't do much lit up and told you the date Hey, what did they It was do? like time and temperature. It could compute, which is probably a calculator. I don't know. Also, in 1956, Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman took acting classes together. Did they? In 1956. Before they were stars. Their classmates voted both of them the least likely to succeed. Really? So they're both pieces of shit assholes. They'll never go anywhere. Wait, were they saying they were assholes or they just... Just least likely to succeed. I guess their acting class thought they both sucked, probably. I don't know if that's true. That's not... I don't even have a reference for where I read that. I read that on popculture.us, and it's, there's no reference or anything. So, so no who knows that's if that's true. true. That might be a lie. So okay. Gene Hackman and or Dustin Hoffman or your families, if anyone's listening, tweet us at History for Jerks and let us know if that's true. <laughs> Another 1956 thing, the first Republican yeah. and president that the New York Times endorsed. Wait was, a minute. The w- first Republican and president. The first Republican ever endorsed and the first president ever endorsed. Okay. By the New York Times was Abraham Lincoln back yeah. in the day. Right. But the last Republican they endorsed was in 1956, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yep. The last there time. hasn't been a decent Republican since Eisenhower. Whoa. Shots fired. If you're a Republican and you're listening to this, yeah. well, let's face it. If you're a Republican, you probably stopped listening a, a long, long time, time ago. ago. Uh, the but if we you are, our But if you are and you've gotten through all of Amy's... Um, my only mine screaming at you and you're degrading say. you. And I, mean, I agree with you, but I think you're a little more uh, vocal than I am, probably. Probably. Uh, but if you've gotten through that, sorry uh, about that. Uh, another thing in 1956, Bet Nesmith Graham 
mother of future monkeys guitarist Michael Nesmith. Yes. Invented. Do you know what she invented? Was it the post-it note? Close. No, it was <sighs> the first correction fluid. That's what the whiteout. Yeah, she made it in her kitchen. Yes. Uh, working as a typist, she used to make many mistakes because she was an idiot and always strove. <laughs> I don't know if she was. So what did before they had whiteout? What did they do? They started over, and she always strove for Ugh. a way to correct her error. Starting on a basis of tempera paint, she mixed with a common kitchen blender. She called the fluid mistake out and started to provide her coworkers with small bottles on which the brand's name was displayed. Nice. And then there's some other things about her offering it to IBM and all this other stuff, but this is not a, a God, we need to, Mrs. That, Nesmith podcast. If we could podcast. just come up with something, the next household the next household object of the day. You know what I'm saying? Like, if we could just invent that. Well, we now set? there's nothing left to invent. Everything's but already done. But there's got to be something. No, no everything's see? already done. No, it's not. I, I just refuse to believe it. Everything's already gone. I always thought, here's one. Oh, boy, here we go. All right, hear me out. Here we go. Got to hear Amy out, everybody. Some kind now of is the time to hear Amy out. Hit the theme song. Stop. Hear Stop. Amy out. Okay. We should have a theme Some song. kind of thing to help, like, when you're washing your face, some kind of a... There's a lot of people who don't wash their face. Some kind of a face-shaped mask that you put on to rinse the soap off so it doesn't get all over the floor <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> Wait, where would the shape face mask go? It, it would have a hose that's attached to the faucet. And so you put the mask on, and that rinses all the soap off. But then, and the, then it sucks the fate the soap back off. I don't know. I haven't thought that far into it. Like you know, at the dentist, or whatever, yeah, where they suck that all the water yeah, through that. Something like maybe that. Maybe the masks. <laughs> well, you're the only one who gets the water everywhere. Like I, I don't. It. I wash my face every night, and then there's never water all over the floor because I do it in the sink. You don't use soap either, though. I do use soap. No, you don't. I use some, a little bit of feces, but mostly soap. No, but what I don't get is, are you standing up when you're I rinsing don't know. it? Like, lean no. over and rinse it. I am. I don't know why it does. <laughs> you're a crazy know. person. Uh, bidet, whoever invented the bidet is a genius. Hopefully, they're doing well. God, can you imagine having That's... to invent that? The trial and error you have to go through. Hey, let me see your butthole. Come here. You have to get like down and. <laughs> hey, Larry, let me try your butthole again. You'd be like, oh, I need a fatter guy. Just make sure that everybody fits. Yeah, and a, yeah, and, and a real skinny guy, and, and a, a real, real old man, right. and everybody. They probably figure out everybody's taints are different, so you got to like. Eh. I don't know. Yeah. Do you we'll... think some old guys their balls are in the toilet water when they sit? On yeah. The toilet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Wrong. And some sit on their balls uh, on the seat. And then some probably get it under the seat and then smack oh, it down on accident. God. There's all kinds of things with balls that you don't want to know about. Yeah. Oh, I never yep. thought of And that. welcome to the Balls Podcast, the Balls and Taint Podcast. The, balls and Taint. Not just balls, the old balls. <laughs> welcome to the old people's Balls and Taint. Actually, if you're an old person and you have issues with your balls and your taint on the toilet, tweet, tweet us at History for Jerks. Old people don't know what tweeting means. They don't know what taints are either. So no, but anyway, sorry to bash Mike Nesmith's mom, but uh, I saw Mickey Dolan's this past weekend at, at uh, Fab Fest in Charlotte. So uh, I think he's the only one left, right? Mickey Dolan's. I have no left. clue. Uh, all the rest of the monkeys have been murdered. The Chrysler Corporation in 1956. Mm -hmm. This is a cool one. I don't know if you know that they offered an under the dash mounted record player phonograph. Oh, in, in, a vi in cars. In cars. That was yeah. in a book that Henry and I read. The Watsons go to Birmingham. They really? Were, yeah, they had a record player in the car. I didn't know they ever did that. Like, I think yeah. I've joked about that. So the option was discon discontinued the following year. But I found it on, didn't work right. on mental really floss. So yeah, bad. there were some issues. So I, I, I found out on mental floss that uh, for those consumers willing to spend an extra $200, now they, that's the equivalent of 1700 today. Yeah. It was called the Highway Hi-Fi. A factory installed record player mounted under the car's dashboard, designed and developed by Peter Goldmark. Uh, and the advertising said uh, using an elastic three point suspension, the unit played non breakable seven inch records. Each side could hold 45 minutes of music, a far more practical solution for people who couldn't tend to the turntable easily. Uh, rather than the ones that only played one song. 
Uh, it also fits snugly under the dash, projecting out at the push of a button so the user can load a record and set the needle before pushing it back underneath and out of the way. Uh, in advertising copy, Chrysler touted that the discs would never skip, not even during sharp turns or while crossing railroad tracks. Yeah, it, right. They said it's almost impossible to jar the arm off the record. The company promised this, anticipating the dubious looks of dealers and buyers alike. As it turned out, attempting to spin a record while in a moving vehicle was every bit as problematic as it might sound. Yeah. But before 8-tracks, cassettes, CDs, and satellite radio, the Highway High Five represented the first opportunity for drivers to have some control over what they were listening to. Yes. They had autonomy, freedom to deviate from radio programmers, invasive ads, and boring talk shows. Naturally, radio stations hated this yes, idea. Yes, I bet. Yeah. So uh, Goldmark tested it in a CBS executive's Thunderbird. And it worked flawlessly in the Thunderbird. Really? Yeah, and it didn't skip at all. He loved it. Uh, but CBS CEO William Paley hated it. He equated the innovation to a form of self-sabotage. CBS had radio affiliates all around the country beaming their signals into millions of cars, and those stations sold advertising spots to generate revenue. And, you know, if drivers began listening to their own stuff instead of the radio, they were... To take your job, Taking their money away. Yeah. yeah and, the, and they were afraid the sponsors would have a tantrum. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Goldmark uh, went directly to his potential customer, a car manufacturer, because he went around CBS. He was like, no, I'm going to just do this. Visiting with Chrysler executive Lynn Townsend, Goldmark sold the company on the dashboard record player as a factory option. He rode along during a test drive with Chrysler employees driving over bumps, railroad tracks, and other obstacles to see if the record skipped, and it didn't. Really? Yeah, it was that the suspension, wow. I guess, was good. The company ordered 18,000 highway hi-fi units, a sizable investment that Paley couldn't ignore. CBS Labs mass-produced the devices then, and Chrysler began instructing their dealers to pitch the add-on to prospective buyers. Each unit would come with six records with the option to buy more, through CBS Columbia, a oh, record you had label. To, you had to buy their kind of records. Yeah, it came with. Uh, yeah, they had they provided oh. the records, which kind of was the downfall here. So, yeah. because uh, you could get them through CBS Columbia that manufacture their unique discs, but uh, that's probably why they. But didn't because skip, Paley, because it was a, a different kind of disc. Well, they had they made a different disc just for this, yeah. and it didn't fit in other record players, which yeah. is another problem. Like these records. We're are only to, good yeah. for this, which right. kind of sucks too. So Paley, the guy from CBS, had a, a lot of influence in this, and he hated rock music. So the choices of the music was shitty too. Oh no! Car owners got the soundtracks to the Pajama Game, uh, some some Tchaikovsky, a jazz record, and a dramatic reading of a George Bernard Shaw play, Jeez. and songs from Disney's Davy Crockett television series and i guess it was advertised to help keep kids quiet the davy crockett thing yeah and the catalog offered spoken word reenactment reenactments of the battle of gettysburg oh, uh i don't know just no. to bore people i don't know what but uh because the grooves were smaller the records couldn't be played on conventional turntables uh and given the shitty selection that's probably fine because nobody wanted to listen to this crap right um but the limited selection was only one problem. The functionality of the Highway Hi-Fi was another. Uh, because they had tested the device in a Thunderbird and in a high-end Chrysler vehicles that were had great shocks and everything, Yeah. once they started trying them in other cars, economical Dodge and Plymouth models, which didn't have very good shock absorption, the records skipped and you know weren't great and scrap, you know, whatever. And the models were the source of several claims against the car's warranty coverage. Local mechanics also weren't audiophiles, didn't have the knowledge to make simple repairs to a record player. Mm. So as word spread, Chrysler went from selling 3,685 hi-fi units in 56 to just 675 in 1957, and they discontinued it shortly thereafter. Yeah. Um, at one point, they tried putting in a 14-disc changer, like a like a jukebox type of thing oh. for a little bit, but that didn't really... Uh, and they had upside down the needle upside down like in a jukebox to reduce skipping, um, but that didn't really work uh, that well, I guess. Mm. Um, the yeah, um, it's probably enough anyway, of that. It went away. That. Yeah, that's enough of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then pretty before they could really work any more on it, eight tracks came out, right? And then, which I still I have no idea how an eight track works. I don't even know what it is. There's like, what's eight tracks. It? There's four on each side. 
and yeah, I remember having to listen to the whole thing before you could flip it, mm-hmm. like a. And there's yeah, there's four tracks on each side of it. And, but I but is it tape? It's, is it tape like at a cassette tape? Yeah. What's inside of it? I've never it's looked like inside of it. It's like a cassette tape, and you oh, put okay. it in, and then but you couldn't rewind or fast. You forward. just hit click which track you want. Then on an eight track player, yeah. the eight tracks are different buttons. Oh, see, my grandma had one, and you couldn't select a track. That's if I remember correctly. I think you're wrong. Oh, well, okay. I think it has eight tracks, but it had two sides, and you had to listen to the whole song. That's what side. I said. On each side, yeah, there, but you was can't two, just, there was four. You can't just play a song. You have to, I, th- I think. I could be wrong, too. Yeah, was, I, I was know. a kid when we played it. They had an eight-track player, and you had to always listen to the whole side before you could flip it. You couldn't rewind We could call it. my Aunt Susie. She still has an eight-track player. Call her player. right now. She still has an eight-track player? I swear to God. Oh, my gosh. She's got all her Motown on eight-track. On eight-track yeah. still? Yep. And you can still, and it still works? Mm-hmm. No. Right here in 2022, her 8-track player still works? I'm pretty positive because I she mentioned it. Oh, my gosh. The other night. We had our 75th yeah, birthday Yeah, Aunt Susie. This, a dedica- this episode is dedicated to Aunt Susie, who just turned 75. Congratulations, Aunt Susie, for making it. That's right. To 75. Anyway, another thing in 1956 that happened. I In this one, I just couldn't find the exact date. Yeah. So, But I have to tell the story. Okay. So the first time Price is Right put an elephant on stage, <laughs> oh boy. according to Adam Needeff's book, Quizmaster, the defecating attraction was mistreated to some degree. Because an elephant, the whole reason you can't put an elephant on stage, apparently, is they shit everywhere. Uh-huh. So in an effort to avoid having the creature poop on camera, a plug was inserted into its anus, oh. which, which is reportedly a common practice in television at the time, for oh animals anyway. Yeah, they put butt plugs in elephants. Ew. Imagine how big an elephant butt plug has to be. Yeah. And and a lot of times they had to use human children Stop. as the butt plug. I don't know. I knew you were gonna uh, obviously push it, if, past if the it failed to work though, the butt plug didn't work on the elephant. Um, Probably shot across the room. Yeah, and a, a, apparently they had an unfortunate elephant. And early in the show, and Price is Right, they had twenty minutes to go. The elephant got frightened, and he did what elephants do when they get frightened: and they shit everywhere. Jeez. And they had stuff to bring on stage, and they were shooting everything from the waist up. The models are tiptoeing around, trying not to step in the in the poop. Oh my god! Anyway, that didn't happen in fifty six, but then, uh, but a stage covered in animal feces didn't deter the show from bringing an elephant out again in nineteen fifty six. This time, they brought it out as a bonus prize. As a bad pun referring to a piano, a contestant had just won. So they're like, and even more ivory, here you go. And they brought an elephant on oh, as a joke. It's a joke. After they won a, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and just thinking, oh, they're not going to want this elephant. Yeah. And then they decided they'll just give them $4,000 instead once they say, I don't want an elephant. Right. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, producers quickly found out that the contestant wasn't laughing. He wanted the elephant. That's what happened on The Simpsons. Yeah, it's, that's that's based on this. Based that's based on, on a this. true thing. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so produ- producers figured anybody with an elephant was gonna want it. So, you know, again, they were gonna have that four thousand dollars. But the winner, the guy who won it, owned a farm in Texas, and he thought the elephant would be great to produce a bunch of natural fertilizer to make caring for it worth its trouble. Um, so they couldn't give away that elephant because they had it was just a Somebody rented borrowed. prop yeah yeah uh, so they shipped one from Kenya oh the poor thing and a- apparently obtaining an animal from Kenya was certainly feasible as selling elephants in Texas and other states had been done before uh, but anyway we can- nobody can find out the fate of that elephant because media outlets didn't really follow up on it so there's no no known idea of what happened to that elephant yeah the uh, poor but baby you know Everybody wants to talk about elephant butt plugs, so there you go. Gross. Another unknown date thing in 1956, mm-hmm. uh, according to PCM Lifestyle Magazine, yeah. uh, Paulina and Ake Viking, that's his name, Ake Viking, they were married in 1958 after being brought together in 1956 by a message tucked into a bottle that Paulina's father, who was a fisherman in Sicily, had discovered at sea. The story goes like this. Ake Viking, a Swedish sailor, was bored while out at sea one day, and he decided to slip a message into a bottle requesting that any pretty girl who found it please write back. The fisherman in Sicily, Paulina's dad, had discovered the bottle at sea 
and he happened to have a daughter named Paulina, and his father had passed the bottle off to her as a joke. But Paulina decided to continue the joke and wrote a letter back yeah. just to see what would happen. Soon, Paulina and Ake were exchanging more and more letters with one another, and they also began to Good develop... Good thing she didn't just throw it back in the sea. Yeah. That would have sucked. Because he well, probably somebody never else might have got it. But he never would have got it back, probably. But they began to develop warm feelings for another one another. Eventually, Ake traveled to S- Sicily to visit his message in a bottle of love. And once they had finally met in person, they were married very quickly. Really? Yep. Uh, the news of their unique love story soon spread, and the pair were even featured as an uh, article in the publication American Weekly. Uh, and the title was Love in a Bottle. You can read the article below. Uh, I don't know. You can le- re- read the article on PCM Weekly. Uh, and it says that the letter actually said, To someone beautiful and far away, he poetically inscribed it. After giving his home address and a brief description of himself, he added, Write to me, whoever you are, and signed his name. With that, he took the paper into an empty bottle of aqua vitae, replaced its cork, and tossed it overboard. Two years went by. Then on his return from another voyage, he found a letter postmarked Syracuse, Sicily. Hmm. Uh, the message was in Italian, which one of his shipmates obligingly translated. It was from a 17-year-old girl who wrote, Last Tuesday I found a bottle on the shore. Inside was a piece of paper bearing writing in a strange language. I took it to our priest, who was a great scholar. He said the language was Swedish, and with the help of a dictionary, he read me your charming letter. I am not beautiful, but it seems so miraculous that this little bottle should have traveled so far and so long to reach me that I must send you an answer. Other letters consigned to ordinary post followed. The first two photographs were exchanged, and finally vows. Ake set sail for Syracuse, and now together he and his pretty, if not beautiful, correspondent, Jeez. who has just turned 18, <laughs> embarked on the sea of matrimony. There are pictures of them of their I mean, wedding. Gosh, like, if not beautiful, I mean, she's not nah, beautiful. Know, so she's, she's not, she kind of looks like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, <laughs> so you go yikes! Not beautiful. Eleanor Roosevelt was a lot of things. Not beautiful. Not beautiful. You. And you know what? Speaking of Eleanor Roosevelt, how come people weren't uh, weirded out that she married her cousin? Oh, she did. Like she and FDR were cousins. First cousins. They're like fifth cousins. Oh, that's why. But still, they're cousins. They had the same last name already. They met at a, I mean, they knew each other. Rudy, Ju- Rudy Giuliani married his cousin. He did? Mm-hmm. It's weird. So yeah. did, uh, what's that, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis? He married his, like, yeah. 10-year-old cousin? Yep. That's really weird. Okay, now we're in the timeline, and we're going to start off with January 2nd, 1956, uh, and you yes. have something, but I have something, too, that happened, but I'll just wait for you to start yours, and I'll I say. it's not my Also thing. the same day. It's definitely not the same thing. Mine's not a. True crime. I'm going to tell the story of the Lover's Lane murders. Ooh, the Lover's Lane murders. I love Lover's Lane. I have been to Lover's Lanes all over the world, Wait all over the country with lovers. Wait a minute. Of all kinds and shapes. No, that's untrue. And sizes. Okay, this is, it takes place in Great Falls, Montana. Okay. I'm surprised they had a Lover's Lane in Montana in 1956. Okay, so we our first contestant on the Price is Right here. Wait, this it's not really Price is no, Right, right? Because I talked about Price Right and oh, Elephant no. Poop. That's why I was saying that. Oh. Um, tall, beautiful, blonde, Patty Kalitsky. Whoa, well, now this one's beautiful. And she's known as Ski to her friends. Ski? Mm-hmm. Huh. She had just crew cut her hair like a character straight from a Dick Tracy comic book. Really? She was a popular 16-year-old junior at Great Falls High School. Okay. She'd fallen head over heels for a handsome young airman stationed at nearby Maelstrom Air Force Base. Ladies love the airmen, y'all. And they were already talking marriage. Oh, that was quick. 18-year-old Lloyd Dwayne Bogle from Waco, Texas, was a Christmas guest at the Kalitsky home. Okay. And had stayed over the new year. All right. So he's the lover? Yeah. He's the... Boyfriend. Boyfriend, lover, sexual guy. But her daydream wouldn't last. Okay. Kalitsky and Bogle went for a date at a drive-in movie on January 2nd, 1956. January 2nd, 1956, the same day that his Hillsdale College uh, had gone on an undefeated team. They had an undefeated football team, and they refused to play in the 1956 Tangerine Bowl because its black players were not allowed to play on the field. 
they were only invited to play in the Tangerine Bowl if they would bar four of their African American players from playing because African Americans were not allowed, and they said, "No, we're not playing in the Tangerine Bowl that same day." So they they said they're not going to play at all because yeah. So and good. it was a big deal for Hillsdale to even because it was a small school yeah. for them to get invited to a bowl. Yeah, and they got invited, and they well, had to they really try to hard go. to get invited. And they got invited, but only if they wouldn't bring their African American players. And they and Hillsdale said. We won't do that. Good. So Good. shout to Hillsdale College in Michigan. That's right. That's yes. awesome for 1956. It is. It's a big stand. Most, of, most places they would have just said, sure, why not? Yeah, and Coach Frank Water said, we wouldn't go if four of our men weren't allowed to play. Good. In a radio interview, he said that. And he said, Hillsdale can be proud that it has rejected football madness and has placed the sport in the proper setting in the college and American community. Bitch. He didn't say bitch. Okay. So they were last spotted at 9 o'clock. Okay. Afterwards, they did what many teens at the time would have done. They drove west of Great Falls to an area now known as Wadsworth Park along the Sun River. Okay. A notorious lover's lane. It's right over the river, right? So it's probably sexy to make out there. Kalitsky's parents expected them home at a decent hour. She had school in the morning. Oh, boy. When the couple didn't show, they hoped the two had eloped, maybe. Maybe that was the... What Maybe happens. they're still alive, but they went and got married. But instead, they lived through a nightmare and never woken up. Oh. Someone had attacked them as they necked in Bogle's car in the lover's lane. They first bound Bogle's hand behind his back with his own belt. He was forced to kneel in the dirt next to his car, then shot execution style in the back of the head. Oh, my gosh. Bogle's killer didn't bother to steal his valuables or money or even turn off his car, which was found with its ignition engaged. That's weird. Its headlights lit and its emergency brake on. After murdering Bogle, his killer turned his attention to Kalitsky. So she had to witness all this. Mm-hmm. Probably scared shitless. She was raped at least once, oh. though the location of that rape remains unknown. Afterwards, the murderer forced her to dress. Then he shot her like her boyfriend on her knees. Oh. Kalitsky died approximately an hour after Bogle. Oh. The next morning, three boys hiking by Sun River found Bogle's body near his car on Lover's Lane. Kalitsky's parents had their answer. Their daughter hadn't eloped. They were living every parent's worst fear. Where was their daughter? Had huh. she been killed, kidnapped? Was she alive, or had she been murdered along with her boyfriend? Hmm. They had their answer on January 4th when a county road worker found Kalitsky's body seven miles north of the murder scene at the bottom of a steep embankment hmm. on a lonely Cascade County highway. Newspaper yeah. reports at the time say she was fully clothed, but they took a vaginal swab anyway. Yeah. And, and the crime seemed motiveless. Her father established a reward fund for any tips that would lead to his daughter's killer, and contributions quickly mounted to more than $500, which is around 5500 today. Okay. Bogle's body was autopsied and sent back to Waco for burial. An unnamed person of interest who had argued with Bogle was questioned and then released. The sheriff called the Lover's Lane murder the most merciless and brutal I've ever seen, and uh. there Kalitsky and Bogle's murder stayed unsolved. Over the years, persons of interest came and went. Keith Wolverton, a captain with the Great Falls Sheriff's Department in the late 1980s and a high school classmate of Kalitsky's, became obsessed with the bullets he was sure were in the cottonwood tree near the location of Bogle's car. If he could only find the bullets on Lover's Lane, perhaps he could trace them to a weapon. Wait, so this guy was just a person? Was just a citizen? a classmate, yeah. So kind of like a true crime enthusiast. Yes. Okay. In they 1956. Used, they used gamma ray technology to locate six bullets. And Wait, they used what? Gamma ray technology. The, you know, the gamma ray is what created Incredible Hulk. Oh. They well, used that to do what? Locate six bullets in the trees. How does that work? Well, how, don't ask me that question. Well, you're a true crime aficionado. I don't. All right. Whoa. Sent them to the FBI for analysis. Nothing came of it. Okay. But the results of Kalitsky's vaginal swab had been well preserved on a microscope slide. Okay. In 2001... Cascade County Sheriff's Office Detective Phil Madison sent that slide to the Montana State Crime Lab. In 2001? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love technology, baby. That lab finally found a break in the cold case 45 years later. What? The vaginal swab contained a sperm cell that didn't belong to Bogle. Kalitsky had definitely been raped, and that rapist had left a DNA sample. Yes. Who is it? Detectives compared that sample to over 35 men, including gangster Joseph Whitey Bulger Jr. Yeah. They ruled out every single one. Madison retired, believing Kalitsky and Bogle's murder would never be brought to justice. Yeah, I would think that. A lot of different people had a turn at this, and we just weren't able to take it to conclusion, he said. The Lover's Lane murders just wouldn't be solved. But then, 
in 2014. Oh, my gosh. A Great Falls, retired Great Falls police detective John Cameron wrote a book claiming Edward R- Wayne Edwards, a serial killer multi- implicated in several murders similar yep. to Kalitsky's and uh-huh. Vogel's, had done the deed. His book alleged that Edwards had also killed John Bonet Ramsey and Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, well, now he seems crazy. Yeah, he remained undeterred when Edwards' DNA did not match Kalitsky's rapist, saying the sample had come from a bungling medical examiner. Uh. But then, two years before, in 2012, Detective Sergeant John Cadner was handed the Lover's Lane murders, a case that had long gone cold, and he wasn't falling for the Edwards whole thing. He thought that was really So this guy was stupid. handed this murder from 1936 because mm-hmm. this guy just had nothing else to do? Well, I don't know. I he was just the next one in line. Okay. First, he digitized the entire case file, which Might took as well. months. Yeah. But even as he digitized the case, he knew they'd only solve the Kalitsky Bogle murders with that sliver of DNA they had. Yep, it's the only way to get it, baby. But the case still sat cold. That is, until law enforcement became aware of something called forensic genealogy. Oh, that? That was that? used to nail the Golden State Killer oh, in that's, 2018. Okay, which I don't... I remember that happening, but I don't know, like... Well, let what me tell the, you. Yeah, okay, explain So, because I'm a dumb guy. Forensic genealogists first develop a profile of the culprit. Okay. Or a DNA profile. A DNA profile. Then they partner with labs and search public DNA databases, right. usually used to help adoptees or children born via donor find, sperm or egg to discover. Yeah. Gen- generally, this turns up a hit in the form of a second or third cousin. Okay. Then they sift through the death certificates and the newspaper clippings and other public records uh-huh. to construct a family tree, which can lead to the killer. Okay. Cadner sent the rapist DNA to Bode Technology in 2019. Okay. Then they constructed a reverse family tree from a cousin's profile. And then Bode Technology gave him a name, Kenneth Gould. Ooh. Gould, born and raised in Great Falls lived there with his wife and children in 1956, uh-huh. a little over a mile from Kalitsky. He had no criminal record and was never interviewed in connection with the crime. In fact, there's no known connection between him and the couple. Uh-huh. He would have been 29 years old when he committed the Lover's Lane murders. There was only one problem. Gould had died on May 31st, 2007. Uh-huh. Sadly, to close the case, giving Kalitsky and Bogle's families peace, Kadner had to confront the killer's children. Oh, my gosh. I Quote, I wasn't sure how they were going to react when I came to them saying, hey, your dad's a suspect in this case. But they were great to work with, he said. Gould was their guy. Sixty years later, Patty Kalitsky and Lloyd Bogle had the justice they deserved. Theirs is believed to be the oldest case ever solved with forensic genealogy. Wow. And then... um, Uh, uh, Is there anything about how the kids reacted? Like, were they like, oh, yeah, he probably did. He's a weirdo. Well, There's got to be other people, because you don't just rape and murder two people and then that's it, right? I don't know. It, it doesn't really say. It just oh. said that um, It said that they Kadner was able to reach out to Kalitsky and Bogle's surviving relatives to tell them. Can you imagine finding said, out after your dad died, like 10 yeah. years later? Oh, by the way, your dad murdered and raped these people in the 50s. Like, oh, my God. Can you imagine? That just, would be insane. He did what? My I bad. mean, some of them, and that's the thing with some of the serial killers and stuff. Some of them, there's no sign. Like they're, they're they don't continue doing married it? life. Yeah, there's no outwards. Like they're not abusive, and yeah. they're not like they're just normal. Are you starting to suspect seeming. me now? I think there's got to be some denial on the wife's part, though, in those situations. They got to have some signs. Because that's what I'm thinking. Like, if, if nothing else, it's like, you know, why is that bloody mattress on the yeah. corner out there? What's going on? Yeah, you know, or yeah. What are you? There's no way somebody does that. Why were you digging in the yard last night? <laughs> I just don't think you're capable of murdering people and raping someone and then just going about your day. I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. Some people are really good at compartmentalizing. Yeah, people are different and weird. Like that guy, what was that That one we watched where the guy got kind of got caught by the uh, documentarians at the end? Oh, the jinx. That guy kind of seemed, uh, yes. you know. That was, m- that was a good of, one. That was my favorite one. That I was think. a good one, yeah. It was really good. I don't like a lot of true crime. I like that one. Anyway, that one was I'll let you finish. Did they am good. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, Ski and Lloyd waited six years, 60 years for justice, a time they could have spent building a whole lifetime together. But because a few sheriffs doggedly refused to give up ski and lloyd have finally found the were any of their family alive to yeah some of the relatives find out uh and then you did you have any references that you need to say or did you yeah this i got from um scarymommy.com oh god (laughs) 
I can't believe that's a website. Okay, but that's a great website because we referenced it, right? Yes, it's right. a good. It's a blog. I well, think. we got a lot to go through because we're and just so starting January. We gotta keep. Yes, let's I'm gonna try to make these. Can quick. we? Can we just take a second and I get some more water? You know, water? we could probably take a quick break and I could just insert a quick advertisement there for the Gruff and Loud show here, which is the greatest YouTube channel of all time. We'll be right back. Hey nerds, check out the Gruff and Loud show on YouTube. Edie Falco. Yeah. Are you familiar with Edie Falco? I I'm I I am a little bit more than aware of Edie Falco. I'm a fan of anything I've seen Edie Falco in. I'm a fan. I've been a fan of her. Now, when you say fan, you're saying you're a fanatic. You're fanatical about Edie Falco. I I do understand where fan comes from, and I would like to <laughs> take this time to retract. <laughs> Retract your statement. Well, if you're going right. to throw out fan mind. as fanatic, no, I'm not a. I'm. Not, I am aware. And if I've you saw, if you enjoyed. saw Candace Bergen on the street, would you fan girl? I mean, uh, Edie Falco. Edie Falco. Yeah. Both. I would hope that I have the presence of mind to say thank you. Okay, you're in a three-way with Edie Falco, Irving Levine, and you. Who are you giving most attention to? Oh, Edie Falco. Okay. Check out the Gruff and Loud show on YouTube. And we're back. Woohoo! Check out the Gruff and Loud show beep, beep, featuring beep. the great Gruff. He's the greatest thing of all time, and everybody needs to know him. That's true. January 8th, Elvis Presley's Don't Be Cruel and Hound Dog single goes number one and stays number one for a record 11 weeks. Yeah. Record for a single. I guess it's both songs, so mm. that's back when they had two at a time. January 9th, Abigail Van Buren. Yeah. Also known as Pauline Phillips, her Dear Abby advice columns first appears in newspapers. Yes. In Dear 1956. Abby. There you go, Dear Abby. You know, her sister was Ann Landers, the other advice columnist. <laughs> Dear Ann Landers. Yeah, they were sisters. Yeah. yeah. I always thought Joyce Brothers was related to them, too. No. <laughs> January 22nd, 30 people die in a train crash in Los Angeles. Yikes. The Redondo Junction train wreck occurred at 542 in the evening. On the Santa Fe Railroad in Los Angeles, the accident happened at Redondo Junction, California, just southwest of Boyle Heights near Washington Boulevard in the Los Angeles River. It uh, killed 30 people and injured 117 more. The first major disaster in the L.A. area covered on live television, the worst train wreck in the city's history. Basically, the trains were, the service was very reliable but often overcrowded. And they were two RDCs, Bud Rail Diesel Cars, mm -hmm. that uh, I guess ran return trips daily. And they had quick acceleration, but uh, their brakes were very poor. Engineers didn't like that. And often ex inexperienced drivers completely passed stations at which they were supposed to stop. On this day, 61-year-old Frank Parrish, the engineer, was experienced on the line, but was making only his second round trip on these RDCs. And uh, so and he wasn't as good as he thought he was. I apparently guess. not. Uh, so the the train left Union Station fully loaded after leaving the interlocking control of Mission Tower. The sharp curve of Redondo Junction, which had a speed limit of 15 miles per hour, was normally reached in six minutes, but the RDCs could reach the junction in only two. The tower man, the signal man at the junction, saw the. Cars turn over onto their left sides as they approach the junction and slide with a shower of sparks and then oh total my darkness. God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? He immediately called the emergency service, who were quickly on the scene, along with the railroad staff from the adjacent L.A. roundhouse. The accident prompted one of the first SIG alerts to be raised by the L.A. Police Department, causing mass traffic jams as medical staff and sightseers rushed to the scene. The media soon arrived, and within an hour of the wreck, KTLA Channel 5 was broadcasting live from the scene, and their floodlights helped illuminate the grisly scene being uh, donated by nearby movie studios. Oh, yeah. And all 30 people were killed and a further 117 injured. 30? 30, yep. Yeah. Wow. Um, an inquiry into the accident estimated that the speed of the train was 69 miles per hour at the point it derailed, oh far in excess of the 15 miles per hour uh, speed limit. Yeah. No charges were ever brought against Frank Parrish, who admitted sole responsibility in the accident. But he was he, the conductor? Yeah, he claimed to have blacked out before the accident, and he did not run a train again and took nearly 
took an early retirement from the railroad. I'd say so. Poor guy. Well, yeah, it's time to go if you're derailing the train. Dio, it's time to go. And then January 28th, Elvis Presley's first appearance on national TV on the Dorsey Brothers stage show happened. And then it's never been the same. And on January 30th, according to History.com, an unidentified suspected white supremacist terrorist bombed the Montgomery home of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. No one was harmed, but the explosion outraged the community and was a major test of King's steadfast commitment to nonviolence. Yes. So King at this time was relatively new to Montgomery, Alabama, mm-hmm. but he had quickly involved himself in the civil rights struggle there. He was a leading organizer of the Montgomery bus boycott, as we talked about uh, That's right. in the previous episode. And... Uh, you know, with Rosa Parks and everything. And it that boycott brought King national recognition, but also made him a target of white supremacists. He was hated. Like, it, he was hated. He would have been hated now. Like, if by, he was by around the right. by the right, they would crucify him. They would look for anything. They would, like, dig well, up all they the would, stuff. Well, they would hate Jesus, Infidelity too. or whatever, yeah. They'd crucify Jesus again. What are you talking about? Trump's Jesus. Anyway, he was speaking at a nearby church on that evening uh, when a man pulled up in a car, walked up to King's house, and tossed an explosive onto the porch. The bomb went off, damaging the house, but did not harm King's wife, Coretta Scott, who was inside with a couple Didn't harm seven her physically. Their seven month old daughter was in there, Yolanda. Oh. News of the bombing spread quickly, and an angry crowd soon gathered outside King's home. A matter of minutes after his home had been bombed, standing feet away from the site of the explosion, King preached nonviolence. Oh. I want you to love our enemies, he told his supporters. Be good to them, love them, and let them know you love them. It was a prime example of King's deeply held belief in nonviolence, as what could have been a riot instead became a powerful display of the highest ideals of the civil rights movement. And that, my friends, is why they are the better. <laughs> They're so much better than most people would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that brings so that's January, and now we got to finish up February of 1956 because we're doing two months, right? Y- yeah. And now in February, sometime in February 1956, according to Manchester Evening News, yeah, Les and Beryl Laley celebrated their golden <laughs> anniversary. Beryl Laley. Yep, Beryl Laley. Uh, they cel- celebrated their golden anniversary by tucking into a 50-year-old tin of chicken they were given on their wedding day. Uh, so <laughs> the former soldier was given the tin of Buxted chicken as part of a wedding gift hamper when he tied the knot with barrel back in 1956. It has remained in the kitchen in the cupboard. So in 2000, this is a 2006, mm-hmm. it has remained in the kitchen cupboard of the couple's Manchester home ever since. As the Laleys marked 50 years of marriage this month, Les decided it was the right moment to take out the tin and eat its contents as a token of their love. Les, who was 73, said, When we got married, I'd just come out of the Army and had very little money, so we did our own buffet. We got a hamper as a present, and included in it was this whole chicken in a tin. We didn't use it and packed it away, and I kept it. The couple bought their first house together, uh, when, and whenever they moved home, the can of chicken considered a real delicacy in post-war Britain went with them. Ew. We kept it safe, said Lynn. And I always said on my 50th wedding anniversary, yeah, I'm going to eat that chicken. So don't, I did. No, don't do, to do an British, accent. British no. accent. Please don't. The pensioner says that he has not suffered any ill effects since sampling the decades-old bird, which she added was good and tasted just like chicken. Ew. Yeah, isn't that great? It's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, tin food usually has a maximum shelf life of three years. That's uh, so gross. Although you, the U.S. Army has found that tinned meats can be an excellent state of preservation after nearly 50 years. Uh, but that's what happened. All right. You like that? Mm-hmm. Keep moving on. Moving on. February 3rd. Have you ever heard of Authorin Lucy? No. So she, in, on February 3rd, was admitted to the University of Alabama, uh, and she was suspended from the University of Alabama on February 7th after a riot. Authorin Juanita Lucy 
was born October 5th, 1929, and died March 2nd of 2022, just this year. Mm -hmm. She was an American activist who was the first African-American student Mm -hmm. to attend the University of Alabama in 1956. Her expulsion from the institution later that year led to the university's president, Oliver Carmichael's resignation. Years later, the university admitted her as a master's student, and in 2010, a clock tower was erected in her honor on its campus. So in September of 52, she and a friend, Polly Myers, a civil rights activist Mm -hmm. with the NAACP, applied to the University of Alabama. Uh, Lucy later said she just wanted a second undergrad degree, not for political reasons, but to get the best possible education in the state. Although the women were accepted, their admittance was rescinded when the authorities discovered they were not white. Oh, no. Backed by the NAACP, Lucy and Myers charged the university with racial discrimination in a court case that took almost three years to resolve. While waiting, Lucy worked as an English teacher in Carthage, Mississippi, and as a secretary in an insurance company. Lucy was finally admitted to the university, but it rejected Hudson, actually, on the grounds that a child she had conceived before marriage made her an unsuitable student. So, no, they didn't both get to go. That's crazy. I didn't even read that before. Matt Truman Ego Trip is the greatest band of all time. Buy their music. Court amended the order. Wait, the one that was black. Yeah, Author and, Lu- Author and Lucy. She was admitted, but she was she was not allowed to go to dormitories or dining halls because they were segregated. Yeah, it was oh Alabama. God. Days later, the court amended the order to apply to all other African American students seeking admission. At least two sources have said that the board hoped that without Hudson, the more outgoing and assured of the pair and whose idea it originally was to enroll at Alabama that Lucy's own acceptance would mean little or nothing to her and she would voluntarily decide not to attend. That's what they thought would happen. Mm. But Hudson and others strongly encouraged her and on February 3rd, 1956, Lucy enrolled as a grad student in library science, becoming the first African American ever admitted to a white public school or university in the state. I swear. Lucy attended her first class on you Friday. You had to be brave. Oh, yeah. My God. Somebody had to start this, and those Somebody people were first. heroes. Yeah. Lucy attended his her first class on Friday, February 3rd, and on Monday, February 6th, riots broke out on the campus, and a mob of more than 1,000 men oh. pelted the car in which the dean of women drove Lucy between classes. Threats were made against her. Life and the university president's home was stoned. The police were called to secure her attendance. These riots in the uni- at the university were what was to date the most violent post-Brown anti-segregation demonstration. After the riots, the university suspended Lucy from school for her own safety uh, because that was a concern. Mm-hmm. And Martin Luther King wrote a really good, there's a really good speech on it, so if you look that up. Uh, but it's kind of long, and we're <laughs> at the second half of this yeah, podcast. Yeah, keep going. But yeah, so that's another author in Lucy, A-U-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. I've never heard of her. That's another civil rights hero to know yes. uh, that people don't talk about. Emo Phillips, um, American comedian Emo Phillips, who I'm And then February 7th, 1956, we have our Rebo. first yes, birthday. Yeah, yeah, I just, and I don't have, I couldn't find any. Happy birthday, yeah. birthday. I just kept Emo Phillips. Yes, yeah, because I'm birthday. Birthday. Uh, he's kind of a weird. You know who Emo Phillips is? Yes, I do. He's funny. He's great. Yeah, I know old, st- old school community. He's opening for Weird Al Yankovic at the Queen City Comedy Experience in Charlotte, North Carolina. Come check it out. Are you going to meet Weird Al? Yeah, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Hopefully. I think so. And then on February 9th, 1956, mm-hmm. uh, the last surviving eyewitness to the Lincoln assassination, Samuel Seymour, appeared on the television show I've Got a Secret. Oh, wow. So this is one I've talked about before on here, and I've watched this video probably 25 different times on YouTube. So you can see this on YouTube. You want to play it? Yeah, I'll play it. You tell our panel, it. please, what your name is and where you're from. My name is Samuel J. Seymour. I'm from Maryland. This is Mr. Seymour from Maryland. And we brought Mr. Seymour yeah, all the way up from Maryland, and by golly, he got in a hotel and fell down the steps and gave himself a shiner. And uh, we urged him not to come on the show tonight, as a matter of fact, and finally got in touch with his doctor, and the doctor said it was up to Mr. Seymour. Mr. Seymour said he wouldn't miss it. So here he is. And feeling the party for the day. <laughs> now then, Mr. Seymour, uh, how old are you, by the way, sir? Ninety-six. Ninety-six years old. So... 
So he was the witness to the Lincoln assassination on April 14th, 1865, when Seymour was five years old. Sarah Cook, his nurse, along with his godmother, Mrs. Goldsboro, who was the wife of his father's employer, took him to see our American cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., where they sat in the balcony across the theater from the presidential box. Oh, my goodness. So he saw Lincoln come into the box, waving and smiling, and later, all of a sudden, a shot rang out. And someone in the president's box screamed, I saw Lincoln slumped toward... I saw Lincoln slumped forward in his seat. Seymour watched John Wilkes Booth jump from the box to the stage. He remembered that he remembered that not understanding what had happened to Lincoln. He was very concerned for Booth who broke his leg in the jump. Oh yeah. As a little kid, you wouldn't understand what's right. happening. I, I'm, a lot of people probably didn't understand what was happening. Um, then on 1956, he was on, I've got a secret. It was two months before his death. Seymour appeared on the February 9th, 1956 broadcast of the CBS TV panel show, I've Got a Secret. After arriving in New York City, he suffered a fall, which left him with a swelling above his right eye. Host Gary Moore, after bringing Seymour on stage, explained that he and the show's producers had urged Seymour to forego his appearance on the show, that Seymour's doctor had left the choice up to his patient, and that Seymour very much wanted to go on. As oh. you watch this, he's bar- he looks like he's barely alive, and yeah. he does die shortly after. But during the game, Seymour was first questioned by panelist Bill Cullen, who quickly surmised from Seymour's age that the secret was somehow connected with the American Civil War, then correctly guessed that it had political significance and involved a political figure. Jane Meadows then guessed that the political figure was Lincoln, and finally that Seymour had witnessed Lincoln's assassination. The rules of the show are that he would win $20 for each of the four panelists who failed to guess the secret, and since the secret was guessed by Jane Meadows, the second of four panelists, he would normally have won only $20. But the host decided to award the entire $80 jackpot to Seymour for his courage in appearing on the show. Yeah, let's hope. Well, also another prize, because Seymour smoked a pipe rather than cigarettes, the show's sponsor, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, gave him a can of Prince Albert pipe tobacco instead of the usual prize, a carton of Winston cigarettes. That's the usual prize. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was the only prize you got? Well, a in addition to the cash, yeah. Oh, with the cash, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And turtle wax. And turtle wax. There was always turtle wax. I just love old cigarette commercials. Like, those are so funny. Mm-hmm. Uh and then on February, or, uh, yeah, February twelfth, nineteen fifty six, we have another birthday. Hit it, Matt Truman Ego Trip, greatest band that you can find at the Village Idiot in Maumee, Ohio. Amy, Amy hates birthdays. Amy hates birthdays. Arsenio Hall was born in Cleveland, Ohio, the son of Fred and Annie Hall. His father is a Baptist minister, and Arsenio Hall performed as a magician when he was a child. Did he? Yeah, I didn't know he was from Cleveland. He grad. I'm being a fellow Ohioan. He graduated from Warrensville Heights High School in Warrensville Heights, Ohio, in 1973. Team colors are blue and gold. Home of the Tigers. Notable alumni include Yvette Nicole Brown, actress, actress, singer, and comedian from the very funny community. She's yes. the best. After briefly attending John F. Kennedy High School, he later attended OU, Ohio University, and Kent State University, which is Bowling Green State University Sister School, by the way. I didn't oh, know it is? That. I didn't yeah. know that. So Arsenio Hall and I went to sister schools. Boom. We're the same guy. We're brothers. We're both from Ohio. I love Arsenio Hall. And then we're almost done. February 23rd, yeah. the Golden Globes. It was the 13th Golden Globes, East of Eden. Ernest Borgnine and Anna Magnani won awards. Uh, (laughs) That same day, February 23rd, Norma Jean Mortensen legally changed her name. To Marilyn Monroe. To Marilyn Monroe. I knew you'd know that one. Yes. And then let's jump to February 28th, the last day in the month of February 1956. And the last month we're covering in this episode, episode 187 of American Timelines. 13 people died in a train crash in Swamp Scott, Massachusetts. Oh. And as I was digging into this story, yeah. I found a little feel good story about a train wreck. Yeah, it's a train wreck, but a feel good uh, story about a train wreck. Kinda. The source of this story is from her own book, 
uh, Charlotte Holt Lindgren's book, The Life and Lineage of Hilmer H. and Grace W. Lindgren. Uh, and it's about Charlotte Holt Lindgren, who was in this train crash. Oh, my. After she graduated from Boston University, she began taking graduate courses in addition to her full-time day work in the dean's office. Every day, Charlotte Holt Lindgren boarded the Boston and Maine Railroad at the Ipswich Depot in Ipswich, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, communicate, uh, commuting to Boston and back. Say that three times fast. Yeah, I can't say all that. Ipswich. On February 28, 1956, she was unfortunate to be in two horrible train crashes in the same morning. You're kidding. But luckily survived them both unscathed. No way. New England was in the grips of a ravaging nor'easter that day with gale force winds and heavy snow. The Budliner she was traveling in had stopped at Swamp Scott. An express train operating too fast for conditions overran a red signal and hit the one she was in at full speed, crushing the parked train and tearing the roof off the top of the car. Oh Just my God. ripped the, rop, the top of the car off. Ugh. 13 people were killed instantly, but, but because Charlotte was laying on the seat asleep, mm-hmm. the engine went right over her, but she was not injured. Oh, wow. She somehow made her way off that wreck and got on a train from Marblehead. It wrecked 71 minutes later in Revere when it, too, was slammed from behind by an express train. Charlotte Lindgren somehow escaped injury in both crashes. I can't believe that. And she became an old lady and wrote a book. And you can see her pictures online. That must be like the opposite of (laughs) Destination. What was it? Final destination. Final destination. It's like the yeah, opposite yeah. of final destination. She's just destined to live. Yeah. Yeah. She just uh, laid. The moral of the story is if you're on a train, lay down, go to sleep. I usually do. That's what I do most of the time. You lay down most on public life. trains in Chicago? I mostly just you're lay good down. At, you're good at sleeping. I like to lay down. You're good. At, you're laying down right now. Kind of. Yeah. Aren't you glad? So the bed worked out? Did the bed work out in the new podcast studio? We had to move the podcast studio inside. Because of the heat. It's such a heat wave. It's a heat wave in the Americas. Uh, That's why our dogs are barking more and there's more sound. Sorry about that. But that was episode 187 of American Timelines. This was a long one. Thank you for listening, friends. Thank you, everybody. Lovers and... You guys All are between. swell, you know that? You and are. here's the thing. Yeah. Here's I want to say real quick. Yes, yeah, say it. We are willing to sleep I with all of you. I want to say this real quick. Yeah. No. Oh. Um, our friend, our very dear friend, Chris Connolly, we saw just recently. Oh, Chris she, Connolly. Shout out. She wanted to know, get out of here, Chuck Berry. What is the thing with that? Because she hasn't yeah, listened. We say that at the end of every episode. And that was the first episode. You have to watch, listen you to the first You have to listen one. to episode one to, to get know that. Because it. it's something that happened in 1990. Yeah. Um, and I... I haven't listened to episode one in a long time, and I'm sure we've grown. I mean, we were just children back then. We were Excuse just me. pups. We were just babies, and now we're old and Now worthless. we're wise and we're grizzled and wizened. We're old and very our, less attractive. We've gotten shorter and more brittle. Yeah, and our belts have loosened? Nope. Tightened, definitely tightened. Belts have been... Oh, tightened. Belts have been bulging at the... We've gotten fatter is what we're trying th- to say. That, yeah. We eat a lot more sweets. We do a lot more laying around. Smoke a lot of weed. I don't smoke any weed. I just can't figure it out. I don't like it. It doesn't make me, it makes me anxious. Well, I don't you like haven't it. found the right blend. I drink 26 acres of reptile juice, which is officially the you best. You gotta try an ever. indica. That would calm you. I tried. You know, I just, let's, let's end this episode here. Let's not Ooh. argue. We're not, I don't think we're arguing. Let's keep our voices down. I'm not, but can we end the episode? <laughs> can we just end this episode? Don't you hate when somebody's like accusing you of being, of arguing of being like not? being yeah. irrational? Like, keep your voice down. What are you, why are you yelling? I'm not. I'm not don't yell. I love everyone here. You're being irrational. I love you all. Thanks for listening. Time you to guys, get out of here, Chuck hey, Berry. Hey, you. You listening right now in your car? You. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You. I look around, Stop looking around. I'm talking to you. I, I love you, and I care about you. So let that put that in your let pipe that and sink smoke in. It. Let that sink in. I'm talking to you. Yep. Yep. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Yep. Uh, download and subscribe or whatever. No, give us. Get. Yeah, we need some review. We haven't had reviews in a long time. None of you are doing your part. Yeah, come on, people. Give us reviews and five stars. Give us five stars, please. I don't know if it does anything. 
Maybe I think it, does. it does. I don't know. We got we've got over forty thousand downloads. You know that? Wow. So anyway, give us now we need the stars and the reviews. Thanks for listening, everybody. Just make it so we don't have to do anything else than this. It'll get better. We'll do singing. We'll do songs. All right. Bye. Bye.